Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. We're through the Iowa caucus and as of last night, the New Hampshire primary. And while Nikki Haley looks like she's going to hang around and cause trouble for Donald Trump for a bit, we'll see. He has now won both of the early primary contests by double digits. And barring any massive disruptions to the status quo, a health scare, a criminal conviction, it just becomes more and more likely we are going to be living through another long campaign featuring the man that I and, and, and millions of other Americans consider to be an existential threat to American democracy. That's where we are. And while I get it, believe me, I really get it, that hearing about Trump nonstop for the ninth solid year is painful, excruciating even, I do hold the slightly controversial position that Donald Trump is undercovered in the main and the aggregate by the media, and that the media, all of us, should be talking about him more. Hear me out here. After the disgraceful end to his presidency, what happened was that we basically allowed him to live in the kind of shadows of the American consciousness. Not that he disappeared, of course, but all the major networks stopped taking his speeches live, again, for very good reasons. He was banned from basically every social media platform, again, for good reasons, siloing himself away on Truth Social, where he essentially shouts into the MAGA void instead of into the loudest megaphone on the planet. Now, again, at the time, many of us thought, I thought, this is a good thing. I mean, for a bunch of reasons. People were sick of hearing his lies, which were becoming increasingly dangerous, right? They had uh, precipitated the violent sacking of the Capitol. But what I would argue is that this arrangement that's been in place now for several years has perversely ultimately come to benefit Trump and his sycophants and his defenders. Because, after all, the more voters hear from him, the less they like him. It is absolutely true that voters are not paying as much attention to Donald Trump as they were four years ago. And when I say he is undercovered, I mean that in a few ways. First, the substantive policy of what he wants to do and would do as president, what he did the first time, what he would do it again. There actually has been quite a bit of really good reporting on the real dangers he presents in a second term. But as of now, I don't think it's quite broken through. Back in 2016, I think most Americans knew the broad strokes of Trump's platform in certain ways, right? The stuff he wanted to emphasize. Build the wall, make Mexico pay for it, enact a total ban on Muslims entering the U.S., and repeal and replace Obamacare. Now, how many Americans, of, by contrast, know that Trump 2024 platform includes a 10% tax, a 10% tax on all products imported into this country? Everything. Think of all the things that are imported, which would make everyday goods like considerably more expensive. Ending birthright citizenship for children born to immigrant parents in the U.S. Millions and millions of Americans un-Americanized. Purging the federal government of tens of thousands of civil servants to replace them with basically MAGA sycophants and lackeys. And that's, I mean, again, that's just a three small things. That doesn't even touch his inconsistent yet obviously extreme position on abortion rights. So how many people know that? I would say not that many, honestly. So that's one way in which Trump is undercover, right? The substance of how dangerous his vision is. That 10% tax thing, the 10% tariff, like, I'm going to bet that's the first time you heard it. And again, we're going to cover this, right? The other way in which he is undercover, and this is going to be even more controversial, but stay with me is the most trivial form of coverage that we all, and believe me, again, I, me, doing this job, hate it. That's, for instance, the Trump tweet news cycle. Remember that? Okay. Ex-president would tweet something aberrant, psychopathic, disgusting, racist, untrue, or cruel, and then a lot of folks, sometimes us, not always, but would spend a day or two talking about it. And it was just, like, incredibly annoying and exhausting. But here's the thing about those news cycles. They were very bad for Donald Trump politically. They were bad. We know that not only because every other Republican in Washington would have to spend 48 hours pretending like they'd never read the tweet they didn't want to talk about, but also because we heard directly from Republican voters they wanted Trump to stop doing it. One 2017 focus group found that Trump risked losing support from his voters in key swing states who felt that he was prioritizing Twitter feuds over actual governance. Another focus group of Pennsylvania voters had a more succinct message, quote, quit tweeting. 
One poll from the same period found that nearly 70 percent of voters and 53 percent of Republicans, a clear majority, thought Trump tweeted too much. This was a consensus view. Now, part of this was they didn't like the tweets because what the tweets revealed is who Donald Trump really is. Some people wanted to pretend it was just about the tweets, but it was Trump being Trump. Guess what? Trump got kicked off to Twitter after January 6th, though Elon Musk has invited him back. And there's not been a Trump tweet news cycle since then. And even though, if anything, he is even more unhinged and odious online now than he was back then. Because he made himself his own little knockoff MAGA Twitter where he kind of gets the best of both worlds. He can blow off steam, showing off what an absolute, I mean, to the bone sociopath he is. And no one outside of his most diehard supporters will ever see it. It's like perfect. I mean, this stuff is really like, I really unhinge. It's stuff that, you know, again, if you were seeing it all the time with a person in your life, you would be worried about them. You wouldn't want them to be like hanging out with you or like being around your family or like in the workplace. Like it would provoke deep distress if any person you knew was doing this. Just last night, spent hours on something of a true social bender, lashing out in all caps, in post after post after post. Again, like in this sort of maniacal fashion that's deeply upset, upsetting and unsettling, attacking everyone from Nikki Haley to his own former press secretary for their insufficient fealty to him. True, like, unhinged crank stuff. And again, in a world where he was posting this on Twitter or Facebook, the entire world would be seeing it. It would have a tangible effect on his public standing. As long as it's relegated to its own private MAGA Neverland, most Americans are understandably more than happy to just ignore it entirely. And it's not just social media either. Unless they're actively seeking him out, most voters don't hear Trump speak at all anymore. Unlike from 2015 through 2020, when basically every network in the country aired his remarks every single day. And every single day, voters were reminded exactly how strange and petty and dangerous the man was and is. And again, they didn't like what they heard. As a result, they voted him out of office resoundingly after one term by 7 million votes. One term incumbent. Doesn't happen that often in American politics. To be clear, I'm not necessarily advocating for airing Trump speeches live and unedited. There's real tangible social cost to doing that, as we noted on this network last night, when Trump literally began his New Hampshire victory speech by lying about having won the Granite State twice in his general elections, when in reality, he lost it both times. As Rachel Maddow pointed out, Trump's refusal to engage with facts and truth and reality really is dangerous. It's something we need to make sure voters remember. Trump saying tonight, after having won the New Hampshire primary, which he has done twice before, having then gone on to say, that's not enough. You can't just claim credit. You have to claim credit. You have to falsify the election yeah. results in the, twice, in the two times that you lost the state is a form of like reality bullying. It's an exercise in bending reality to his will and insisting that others follow. It's an exercise in making people who love him denounce reality right. and endorse his view instead as a form of fealty, as a form of loyalty. And it's a way of breaking the truth. So, yes, I get, I mean, again, <laughs> this is what I do for a living. This is my one precious life. I've been doing this for nine years, right? I, I get that paying attention to Donald Trump is painful. It, for lack of a better word, it sucks, okay? <laughs> I've been doing it since 2015. And believe me when I say that I want nothing more than to never have to talk about him again. But unfortunately, it seems as though reminding Americans exactly who he is, like the guy in the flesh, not some memory of him, not some characterization, but him in the full realness of him and how much they actually dislike him may be crucial to saving American democracy from his current campaign to destroy it. An interesting data point. Take a recent Marist poll out of New Hampshire, for example. Voters there were finally forced to pay attention to Trump, right, in that state, as he campaigned for the primary vote. So people's attention was on him. And for, I think, a lot of folks, it was probably the first time they'd really thought much about the ex-president for years. What was the result? Even amid a wave of less than favorable headlines for President Joe Biden, right, in New Hampshire, where there's a controversy over the primary, the poll found Biden beating Trump in New Hampshire by seven points. That's the same margin he won by in 2020. 
And my hypothesis here, and I think there's a lot of evidence for it, is that as soon as voters are forced to start thinking about Donald Trump again, they remember all the reasons they dislike him in the first place. The original Trump critic turned Trump sycophant. Perhaps the most squirrely of them all is Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina. Back in 2015, Senator Graham was running against Donald Trump for the Republican nomination, and he was about as critical as it gets. I think he's a kook. I think he's crazy. I think he's unfit for office. He's a race-baiting, xenophobic, religious bigot. He's a jack You know how you make America great again? Tell Donald Trump to go to hell. Then after he lost the primary and Donald Trump became president, Graham did a complete 180. He wanted so badly to be close to the man in power, he was willing to humiliate himself to get there. In October of Trump's first year in office, Senator Graham tweeted about a round of golf he played with the president, quote, President Trump shot a 73 in windy and wet conditions. How bad did he beat me? I did better in the presidential race than today on the golf course, exclamation point. The slobbering continued up until January 6th when Senator Graham claimed he finally had enough. Trump and I, have, we've had a hell of a journey. I hate it being this way. Oh my God, I hate it. From my point of view, he's been a consequential president. But today, first thing you'll see. All I can say is uh, count me out. Enough is enough. I've tried to be helpful. <laughs> By the way, consequential is funny. Now, that didn't last long. Soon enough, Lindsey Graham was right back at it, tearing up on Fox News as he literally begged viewers to send Donald Trump money. I'm sorry I'm so upset, but please help President Trump. If you can fi afford five or ten bucks, if you can't afford a dollar, fine. Just pray. Make sure you vote as early as you can in your state. Don't risk anything anymore. Vote as soon as you can. Pray for this country. Pray for this president. And if you got any money to give, give it. <laughs> bro, bro, come on. Now, nine years into this routine, Lindsey Graham has flip-flopped once again. According to wild new reporting, Graham turned on a dime and, quote, threw Trump under the bus during his grand jury testimony in Fulton County, Georgia. Trump faces 13 charges in that state in connection with his efforts to steal the 2020 election. Quote, Graham testified that if you told Trump that Martians came and stole the election, he'd probably believe you. He also suggested to the grand jurors that Trump cheated at golf. It got even weirder from there. After Graham was finished testifying, he bumped into District Attorney Fonnie Willis in a hallway and thanked her for the opportunity to tell his story. That was so cathartic, he told Willis. I feel so much better. Then, to the astonishment of one source who witnessed the scene, South Carolina's senior senator hugged the Fulton County DA. According to one witness, Willis was like, whatever, dude. All of those crazy revelations come from a new book, by journalists Michael Isakoff and Daniel Clademan, titled Find Me the Votes, a hard-charging Georgia prosecutor, a rogue president, and the plot to steal an American election. I'm happy to report that Michael Isakoff will join me for an interview about the book and all those incredible details in it on Tuesday night next week. So, Senator Graham, set your DVR.